Well, hello, hello, everyone. We're just going to give it a few more minutes to get started here. Welcome, welcome. Hi, Kim, it's good to be here. Hello, hello. It's great to hear your bright, smiley, shiny voice and you see your yeah. bright, smiley, shiny uh, face. Do you, want us, do you prefer for us to be on video or do you like for us to be off video mute? Uh, that's entirely up to you. It won't distract me if you're on video, um, unless you happen to have somebody walking around in their underwear in the background. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I will ask everyone to be on mute, though, for Excellent. a period of time. Sure. I'll just wave and say hello. It's great to be here. Really excited about this. Oh, awesome. Wonderful. <laughs> I am so excited to have you here. Good. I'll hop off and uh, look forward to it. Hello, everyone, wherever you're yes. from. Yes. Yeah, we're just going to give it another minute here. Um, <laughs> All right. All right. It is one minute after the hour here. The doorbell continues to ring. Zoom has done an update, so I think they've even changed the, the sound of their doorbell. All right, welcome, welcome. We have a wonderful group of people today. Hello, Lee from Vancouver, BC. If you wanna just, even in the chat, if you wanna just write your name, let me know uh, who you are, where you're from. Um, even feel free to put in uh, any questions or um, reasons why you decided to join today's webinar. Uh, I try to keep my, my webinars as, as interactive and relevant as possible, uh, because one of the things I personally want I'm in a webinar, I can't stand when the, the instructor goes ahead and just goes through in material and doesn't actually apply examples that would work for me. Um, so the more information I have about uh, what your business is or what you do, um, the more I can ultimately try to pull those examples out of my brain and give you the most relevant information. Hello, Michael from the Bay Area, Mike in Vancouver, Brian in Calgary, Charleston, Janine, Marie in Edmonton, Umar in Calgary, Adrian, Los Angeles, uh, Rabea from New York, welcome, welcome. Yes, and Suzanne in Boston, it's also wonderful to see all of you here. Uh, how many people have seen this presentation done before, either through Zoom or um, maybe one of my other methods? And how many of you is this the first time? Uh, go ahead and let me know if this is your first time maybe watching one of our webinars, um, checking out. First time for Barb, first time, first time. Oh, wonderful. Uh, Lizanne, welcome. It's great to see you here as well. Uh, Lizanne and I met uh, years ago at HubSpot's annual event um, inbound. So this is uh, absolutely fantastic. All right, the doorbell is going to continue on for a short period of time, but I am actually going to get started uh, because I am a big believer in um, early is on time, on time is late. And somehow I, uh, we're going to actually just open this up here. Somehow I ended up doing some weird type of Zoom thing into my um, screen. So hopefully it will just show normal when we go ahead and do a presentation here. The chat will be, oops, we're going to move ourselves back here. I would love to get us right to the very end, but we're not, uh, you're like, oh, I missed out on the whole thing. We're like, no, that's okay. We'll have time to get to that. Um, the chat is open as well. I see a couple of you are still writing in there. So don't forget to put yourselves in the chat as well. Um, put any questions that you have. I will save time even at the very end for the questions. So if we don't get all the questions addressed right away, um, I will save a few minutes at the very end to address as many questions as you possibly can. 
So welcome to the six slide proposal that closes your six figure deals every time. How cool is that? Let's get you more business, faster business, more revenue, more sales. The six slide proposal was one of those things that I created back when I worked in corporate sales. I uh, was working for Xerox at the time and together my boss and I sat down as we would deliver these proposals to clients in like, you know, the thirties, forties, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sometimes the most, most amount of um, the biggest deal I ever signed when I was with Xerox was a deal actually worth $1,077,000. And we still used this exact same formula every single time. And when I worked for American Express, despite the fact that American Express had these very lengthy, long documents and everything, we still went, I still reverted back to the six slide proposal because I knew it worked. And we would go ahead and we would deliver our, our solutions to our clients, whether that was in the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in this exact same formula. Today, as a sales trainer and a practitioner of, of all things premium sales for premium prices, we still deliver this. And for our students that take the six slide proposal, one thing they come back to me and say is, number one, holy crap we closed our deal and it was so easy to do. It was so much easier to do it this way than it was to do any other way. So this is how cool this is. So my personal sales background, um, like I said, I had worked for Xerox, Clarion, American Express, Purolator. Um, in all those companies, I was um, I became top rep in all of those companies. Now, the one thing that I will say with all of those companies is I was working for Xerox in the Great Recession of 2008 to 2009, and we I still became the top rep of that year in 2009 because of the ability to be able to connect with our clients, to connect with our buyers on what their goals and ambitions were. Sometimes when people are not not really sure what is going on they'll put on their blinders and they're like I just need to get through the first next month I just need to get through the th the three months six months and then I can look at that afterwards and the nice thing about the six slide proposal is that we avoid the conversation of what do you just need to do to survive and rather what do you need to do to thrive how do we get you past that and by understanding how that conversation flows you're going to naturally become even greater um, I was top rep uh, at American Express in 2011 and 2012 as well as in pure later when the oil prices tanked I live in a place where oil oil kind of is the natural driver of a lot of our economy and when oil prices tanked we still use the six slide proposal to help us to grow and it doesn't matter whether you're talking to mom and pop shops small businesses or international conglomerates the same proposal will work for you get it working and you, you will avoid yourself all the headache and the pain of the thank you so much, we'll contact you with our ready or the, oh, well, you know, we're really happy to have this information and we're gonna let you know when, what we decide in the next few weeks or months or something. Oh, I want to avoid that, right? And by understanding how we need to deliver this information, it's gonna make it a lot better. So who is KO Advantage Group? KO Advantage Group, um, it, we really, what we do is we provide consulting businesses, Fortune 500 level sales training without that Fortune 500 price tag. Between myself and my teammates, we have uh, well over like 40 years plus of sales and corporate experience. We are now at a team of seven. So when I use the word we, we do this, well, I'm talking about to we as in like our team of seven and growing. What else will we give you? We give you more sleep because you're going to know where your deals are coming from. You're going to be much more cash flow predictable. You're going to know which clients are going to say yes and for how much and when they're going to say yes, as opposed to feeling like you are just throwing darts on a dartboard and saying, oh, I hope this will stick. Today is June 1st. And I can say emphatically, if you don't know with at least an 80% certainty what you are going to close at the end of June, then please come reach out to me and my team so we can help you get to that point where you are much more cash flow predictable. Even if it is just for one of our free sales strategy sessions, I promise by the end of that 20 minutes, you will come away with so much more clarity on the metrics and the things that you need to start measuring because sales should not feel like this ambiguity ambiguous, like I don't know where it's coming from. We need to have this as a process. 
The other thing our company does is we give you more empowerment to say no earlier on from those clients that just don't fit. They're not ideal clients. They're the ones that are going to nickel and dime you and drive you down. They're the ones that are the bad payers. They're the ones that end up asking for everything and not wanting to pay for anything because you're going to be better at being able to target them and figure out who is not that perfect fit in that first meeting you're going to know and you are going to be okay saying no to them because you have built yourself a process that allows you to continuously grow your business faster and easier than ever before. So the first question I want to ask you is when is the right time for pros? If we're talking about proposals today, when is the right time to propose? Is it when, you know, the client says, I'm ready for a proposal? Is it before the competitor goes ahead and proposes? Is it the moment that they contact us on our contact us page and says, oh, could you send me some information? Would you mind sending me a quote? It turns out that none of those is actually the right time to propose. Okay, you, but Kim, like if a client asks you for the proposal, you probably should give them a proposal. Uh, I wanna be very clear. Just because the client has asked you for the proposal does not mean they are ready for the proposal. Because the only time we should give the client a proposal is when they're ready to take the next step. The intention of the proposal is to have the client make a decision. And if the client is not in a position to make a decision, then chances are you're probably not ready for the proposal. Because if they're not ready to make that decision, anything you show them is essentially no different than a brochure with a price tag. And there's nothing wrong with this, but let's make sure we call a spade a spade. If you show a client what you will call a proposal too early in the sales cycle, it's not a proposal. It's essentially a bro brochure with a price tag. Because the one thing that we do that a lot of other sales programs don't do is we think about what it, what it takes from the other side of this relationship. See, sales is a two-part relationship. There is a salesperson or the person, the value provider, the service provider, whatever it is, and then there is the buyer. You don't show up to couples counseling only to sit there and think about, okay, what do I need to do in this relationship? What do I need to do in this relationship? How do I finally get my husband to cook dinner and do the dishes? I need to figure out how. There's not about talking about just one person. The difference between any type of sales training or sales programs that only talk about what the seller does is called manipulation and coercion. How do you force somebody to take action without them knowing that that is the action that you want them to take? Whereas what we do is we look at this from a much more collaborative and holistic viewpoint. Where is that other person in this relationship so that we know when is the right and appropriate time to act? What is the right and appropriate information to provide them? So inside the buyer's journey, essentially when, when is the right time to propose? The right time to propose is when the client is ready to buy. They need, they have to have had make a decision that they are ready to buy. Everything before that is leading up to the relationship. And oftentimes people will be at the collaboration stage. Well, would you be willing to show me some information? And we will just throw them a, a proposal at this point in time. And we're leaving the client up to their own devices to actually decide if this is the right fit for them and then decide if they're ready to buy. They might even just be at seek a solution. Would you mind sending me a quote on our contact us page? And we send them some information, but they're at seek of a solution. They're they're not ready to buy yet. So your goal at that point in time is to do what you need to do in order to get you to the right spot. Inside your sales cycle and the buyer's journey, go ahead and take a screenshot of this if you like, because this is probably one of the most impactful pieces of information you will ever get. Our students actually get a laminated copy of this that they pin up on their walls because we believe in this so much. The right time to propose is when the buyer has an intent to buy. They know their needs will be met from a solution. There's a whole bunch of steps that have to go before that to know that you are going to be delivering the right proposal. Sorry, my apologies. Um, also, here's the other thing. Nothing new should be presented at the proposal. 
If you are providing your client with new information that they have not seen before, they are not going to be ready to say yes. How can you then tell me that you have a greater than 80% certainty that the client is going to say yes if you are providing them with a whole bunch of new information? Think of this like romantic relationships. Imagine sitting there and having dated your significant other for a, a, a certain amount of time, whatever that time is. And then that significant other decides that this is the moment that they want to propose to. And in this beautiful, grand, romantic gesture, they go ahead and they provide a ring and they sit down and they say, baby, baby, will you marry me? And oh, by the way, the IRS is after me. The car that I've been driving is actually a rental. I actually don't even own my own car. I have six illimited, illegitimate children across six different states. And the place that you've seen actually isn't my place at all. That's an Airbnb because I actually live in my basement suite of my parents' house. But all of this new information should not be relevant to your decision because right now is the moment that I've asked you, will you marry me? The person on the other side would be like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I, you have just provided me a whole bunch of information. I need to think about this. Your buyer is no different. If you were throwing at them, here's a solution and here's other things that we've done in the past and here's the ways that we can think we can impact your business and here's the price. Yes, including the price should not catch the client off guard. That is the fastest way you will ever stall your sales cycle because I cannot be prepared to make a decision if I don't even know what I'm saying yes to. This is when your client will come back to you and say, okay, I need some time to think about this. You have just done a whole crap load of information on them and like they're gonna be excited to say yes? I don't think so. So your goal throughout the entire sales cycle is to be a tour guide on this process, is to actually lead the person away into the directions you want to show them what you want to show them, but do not continue on until the other person is ready to go. A terrible tour guide would say, here is the map to your museum. I will meet you at the gift shop circle any areas that you have questions about. And when I see you at the end, I'm happy to answer them for you. That is the worst tour guide in the world. Nobody would ever go on another tour like that. Your clients are no different. You don't just say, here is a bunch of information I'm going to provide you. Let me know what kinds of questions you have and then contact me and let me know how I can answer them. Why would I buy that service? Why would I pay a premium for that service? If right now is the moment that you are going to show me what it is like to work with you. What you don't want to be is this a dog pulling on a leash. If, if you ever see an aggressive dog pulling on a leash, they'll go ahead and they stop. And, oh, I got to get much further. And they will pull the other person and the other person is resisting going further. Hold on. I need to take a moment to breathe. Your client is trying to pull you back and you are saying, no, we need to get to the end. Don't be that dog pulling in the leash. So the fastest way that you're gonna sign, get your deal signed, okay? If you want to really get your fast deals, number one, you have to understand your ideal buyer persona. We'll do a whole different webinar just on this slide because this is how important it is. You want to be so crystal clear that these are the people that will always say yes to us. Anybody outside of this is the exception and not the rule. I want you to only focus on those that are the rules and not the exceptions. As our team, we actually had our quarterly strategic meeting uh, last week. And one of the conversations we had is who are those ideal fits for us? Who are those people that will always say yes to us? If we saw any types of companies, any types of individuals like that, 100% of the time, or at least 99% of the time, that is an ideal client for us. Anybody who is less than 99% of the time is the exception. And it is not that we won't do business with them. We're just not going to seek them out. We're not going to spend our energy seeking them out because there's too many other fish in the sea. If your whole thing is to sell to everyone, I can work with any small business across the entire coast to coast, across the greater United States. 
you are selling to no one because when you speak to me, I want to know that you're speaking directly to me. We work with a very specific segment of businesses. We work with those that are business to business, small business owners that can align themselves as a premium service and therefore deserve the premium price with that service. If you are not one of those companies, that is okay that you are here to learn, but chances are any other information that we give you may not apply to you and that is okay. Take what you will and leave the rest. But for those of you that are sitting here and like nodding yes the entire time, you know that we have worked really hard to ensure that the information for you is specifically for you and not trying to blanket everyone. The other thing we talk about in our, in our program is understanding how you are going to create value. So inside our sales cycle, the value creation side actually happens everything from where the first place you move to in that, that phone call, that elevator pitch, that email. But every interaction should be creating value. We do actually different types of webinars. I think I have three different types of webinars that touch on this particular topic directly. Everything from what are the right questions to ask to how do you make a proper phone call to how is value ultimately created from the client. But when you understand how to do that, this makes it a lot faster. One of the reasons why a sales cycle is a cycle is because I want you to think of this like a pendulum. It might take a little bit of extra energy to move the pendulum up, but once you let it go, it moves very, very quickly. And the reason why it's also a wheel is because of centrifugal force. You get that flywheel moving and it makes it easier and easier to move every single time. So let's talk about the proposals. I don't want to spend too much time on this other areas. If you need help in this, either connect with us for a sales strategy session or continue to watch for more webinars where we'll talk about those other areas. Let's talk about the proposal though. What is a proposal not? Because a lot of people get this area confused. They use the proposal to mean a synonymous to a scope of work, a letter of intention, a contract. If I ask somebody, how many pages is your proposal? I will hear everyone tell me that their proposal is as little as two pages, but most of the time their, their proposal is 10 pages, 12 pages, 20 pages. We include the implementation plan. We include pricing solutions. We have an a la carte menu that we include. We have an entire scope of work. We have our terms and our conditions and all this. Stop. A proposal is a proposal and a proposal has a very specific place in the sales process a proposal is a selling document you are you there to sell a proposal in a romantic relationship should not be confused with the marriage certificate or the prenup or the first date or any other information that i'm going to need in order to know that i'm going to move to the next decision which is then to get married the proposal is a moment in time. It is a summary of the journey we have gone on together. The proposal is your final selling document. Everything after the proposal is because the client has said yes. Yes, I'm ready to move forward. Yes, I believe that this is the right direction that we need to go through. It overviews the journey that we're going to go on. Honey, darling, sweetheart, Together we have crossed so many barriers. And if I never found you, my life would be terrible and lonely. And thankfully I found you because together we are gonna accomplish so many more of my hopes and dreams. And our clients want to have that feeling too. Because yes, alone they can do a lot, but because they found you, together whatever their hopes and dreams and goals and ambitions are, they achieve it so much greater because you are there to help me. They're gonna summarize the goals and you're gonna bridge the gap. This is where you wanna be. Here's how together we will help to get that place. Your six slide proposal. This is your six slide proposal. This is the format of it. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time going through each one of these areas as we go forward. But the six slides that you need is number one, gonna be your overarching goals. Where does your client want to be in the next year, 
three years, five years time. If the client is a big enough client, they may talk about their 10 year plan, but I don't feel like you need to get through that process. The overarching goals are irrelevant, whether they choose to work with you or not. The goals have typically been established before they've ever met you. All this is is a reiteration to the client on Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, just customer. I know this is where you said you wanted to be. These are the places that you want to be. Is that correct? The reason why this slide is so important and almost every single proposal I see that does not take this type of format leaves this out. They leave this out and it's so important. The reason why this is so important is that if you miss this, if you are trying to present to me, you are trying to sell to me, and you can't tell me where my company wants to be in three to five years, you can't relay back to me what my overall goals are, throw the rest of your proposal out. You have got everything else wrong, okay? If you don't know where as a company I want to be in the next year, three years, five years, I don't care how amazing your solution is because everything that I am going to invest in in my company should somehow get me closer to that goal. Reiterate to the client, this is an easy way for them to say, yeah, you're already talking about yeah, us. You're already understanding where we want to be. The second slide talks about the current state and the consequences. This is not what you tell your client in terms of here's how terrible your life will be if you choose to make no action. But rather, this is where you will be because you're choosing to take no class. Where do you, where will you be if you choose to take no action? What is the impact of that? How bad could it get? What are some ways that your current solution has disappointed you or left you frustrated or cost you more money? See, the difference is, is that I'm asking the client questions and the client is going to give me responses. And that is the information that I'm going to use to fill in this section. Thirdly, we get into the ideal state. So if that is where my goals are in the next three to five years, the ideal state should show me where I will get to that's a little bit closer to my goals, not quite there yet, but not quite at the beginning of us doing business. The ideal state is where will we be together about three to six months after we have started doing business together after your solution is already working after your project has already finished whatever you're speaking to your client this is where you are after it has already been implemented what does that look like how will that feel how will you know it was successful the fourth slide We'll talk about then the product or service and how it will support this, right? This is all done as a slide deck. And the reason why I want your product or service is a slide deck is because you are forced to simplify your information. The confused mind says no. And if you inundate your clients with so much information about what your product or service is, they're going to think this is overkill for me. This looks like a make work project. I don't know if we're ready for this type of commitment just yet. We're just looking for something really easy. And so by forcing yourself to do this as a slide deck, you will force yourself to be between the three to five bullet points on what are the most impactful features for that client because they have said so. Number five, your timeline. This is your closing slide. One of the main reasons I see people come back to me and say, Kim, oh, my client just can't make a decision. Oh, they said that they're going to talk to me when they're ready. And I don't know when they're ready yet. Chances are it's because you've missed out on this slide, the timeline slide. The timeline slide is the most critical slide to your entire process. And the irony is typically the timeline is defined in the very first meeting that you speak with your client, but it may take you three, five, seven, eleven 11 meetings after that before we finally get ready to propose. But the timeline is important. And this will be the difference between your client then saying, we need to wait on the decision versus saying, 
yes, we need to make a decision right now. We need to make a change for this right now. We'll talk about the timeline in a little bit and what needs to be included in that. And then number six, finally, finally, we will talk about the client investment with that return on investment. This is your pricing page. Your client should fully expect what the price should be. If your client feels completely clueless about what your price will be, you are not ready to prepare. You need to anchor your price before you get to this point so that when you present the price, the client doesn't feel sticker shock. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So your client's goals, okay? Here's the shocker. In slide number one, what are your client's goals? Your client has goals that do not include you. I know, <gasps> what do you mean, right? My client isn't in the business to just buy my service and products, right? I'm currently reading, um, if you haven't read it yet, my, my post-it notes, The Goal, okay? This is a fantastic book. It's written like a novel. Um, I Another little reading, add to your reading list. Um, but what it essentially does is like, what is the client's goals? Okay. I'm going to give you like the quick little, you know, summary here. Your client has one goal. Every business has one goal to make more money. <gasps> oh my goodness. What do you mean? It's not just about the money. Okay, fine. It doesn't have to be about the money, but it's about what the money can do for you. Okay. The client has goals and what they want to achieve is something bigger than you, right? They want to have, you know, they want to make more money so they can provide more to charity so they can create a better social economic impact so that they can expand their operations to various states or cities so that they can create a, spend more on research and development and create a higher product or service so that they can achieve more clients and revenue, whatever it is. At the end of the day, it all has to drive towards more money understand what that goal is and how does your product fit into that one of the things i was on a presentation and somebody says how do we sell in these economic times how do we change our message if your product or message does not somehow show me how as a client i purchase that and through some type of stepping stone it will help me grow my business then you are out to lunch even if you said your product or service saves time saves money saves energy it is not about the time savings for me. It is about what I can do as a business in order to take that time savings and reinvest it to make my people or products more profitable. It's what I can do with that money savings so that I can take that money that I would have been spending and reinvest it into something that will help to make me more profitable, gain more money, grab more market share, whatever it is. There is something more. Your product or service should ultimately help a client get to that bigger picture. I see we have a few questions and comments in here right now. Um, so I'm just going to take a moment to take a look at this. Yeah, clear and focused. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, have you got any ideas of adaption for an offer to buy something rather than sell? Um, Gregory, I'm not too sure what your question is. So I am going to, I'll probably take you off mute at the end and you can clarify that. Um, I'd love to see some examples if possible around executive coaching, leadership development, and organizational culture. Yes. So, I mean, anytime we're talking about um, organizational culture, I mean, this is about how, if you're going to invest in helping me with leadership development, how are you going to then take those skill sets and help me? make my people more productive, which will ultimately help me gain more revenue, which will ultimately help me become more productive, pro profitable, something. Because our, our managers are now better able to communicate to our employees, it will then allow those employees to, to be able to understand we, which areas that they can help focus on to help make the company more profitable. By being able to deliver better lines of communication, we can foresee any problems before they occur, allowing us to decrease decrease the number of mistakes that are made, the cost control measures, but also ensure that anytime we're, we're seeing that decrease, the company can then reinvest that into even more pro programs, even more services, even more research and development. This is about taking, drawing that, that final line and continuing on. Okay, so the destination versus the transportation. This is your current state versus your ideal state. So the difference between the destination for the versus the transportation 
Right now, I want you to think about when your client is in a situation, right? And most of us are feeling this right now. I want to be anywhere else but right where I am right now. I wish things were back to normal. I wish we were able to, to just be able to talk to our clients the way we could. I wish we were able to do something. They want something more than what they have. If your client is happy with the status quo, well, we're okay with what we have. There's really no need for us to change. Then I want you to take that as an opportunity to say, thank you so much for your time and move on and go talk to somebody who would like to see things improve, who would like to see things better. Because if you are struggling right now to get them to articulate that right now deserves to be somewhere better, then you're in the wrong place. Now in the next scene, what I want us to talk about is where do they actually want to be? What does it look like? So airlines do this really well. Let's think about Delta Airlines, for instance. Now, typically, Delta Airlines really pushes their types of airlines and vacation packages and just flights anywhere, usually somewhere in January or February. When it is winter apocalypse, when you want to be anywhere else but here, if you're in Phoenix, chances are they're probably pushing you right around July and August. It's just way too hot. You want to be anywhere else but Phoenix. But in Chicago, you want to be anywhere else but Chicago in the middle of January or February. It is cold. It is freezing. Like, take me anywhere. And the next place they show you, <sighs> Cancun. Oh, because when I'm changing the snow, the white covered snow filled streets, to white sand beaches. I'm getting rid of frost on my face with wind chill to a light ocean breeze. And I'm trading my cup of coffee that is so desperately keeping me warm with an ice cold cerveza. Ah, oh, life is amazing. Life is beautiful and it is blissful. That is what we want our clients to think about. Where do they want to be? At no point in time does Delta Vacations, Delta Airlines focus you entirely on the transportation. Listen, we don't really care where you get, we just wanna focus you on how to get there. This is gonna be, we're gonna be flying a uh, 737 with 140 other passengers. We're gonna be cattle calling you onto an airline about two and a half hours before your actual site arrives. Hopefully you're using one of your standard carry-on bags because we're, we're already at capacity for check-in. If you're already stressed out, that's okay. We're gonna be selling you overpriced drinks from one of our stewardess. So feel free, airline attendants. So feel free to you call them, but you better order two because it might be hours before you see them again. They don't focus on how they're going to get you, you there. They focus on where you will be. Now, here's the other thing. Delta could care less the moment you get off that plane. The moment you get off the plane, they don't care what happens to you. You're off the plane, but they focus you on that beach, the beach. And it's the last mile. The thing that happens after your product or service is taken over, that's where your client wants to be. Too many of you, I hope this comes as an epiphany to you. Too many of you, when you're explaining your proposals to your clients, you are talking entirely about the plane. You are talking about what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, how long it's going to take you there. Here's some of the issues that may arise. Here's what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do for you. And by the end, we should get to the end in about six months time. Does that sound amazing to you? And the client is so focused on the airplane that they forget the reasons why they got on that plane in the first place. Because it wasn't about getting off at the airport. It was about getting to the beach, which was still another five miles away, which they're responsible for getting themselves to the end. But you helped them get there a lot closer. Okay, number four, their solution. So your solution should really focus on the key benefits of that product or service. You're only gonna mention somewhere between three to five touch points. You will save any details for the end. Ambiguity is your friend here. This is not about what you do, but how it will help you support your client to getting where they want to. This isn't about the fact that you do executive coaching. 
This is about how that better level of communication is going to allow the client to be able to better communicate with their employees, ultimately allowing them to foresee issues that will arise in greater speed than they ever could, allowing the company to become much more proactive in addressing them, ultimately saving them time and energy and money that they should better reinvest into other areas of their business. This isn't about just making sure the book keep the books are done on a monthly basis. This is about allowing the books to be done in a timely fashion so that the client can better cash flow predict and make adjustments to their expenses in order to ensure that they're consistently staying profitable month after month. This isn't just about offering better WAN solutions, LAN solutions than anyone else, faster internet speeds than anyone else. This is about allowing multiple employees in the same offices to all video conference their employees and their customers without compromise and being able to show in the same way that we are still a high value and consistent company. There's nothing worse than being on a video call that goes in and out really patchy. It makes you, it makes the client like, oh, I wish there was so much good information. I wish I knew what they were talking about. We want the client to agree first that this is the right solution for them. If they can't agree to the solution, it's irrelevant what the price is. We need them to say, yes, this is going to help me. Yes, I can see how that feature is ultimately going to help my business. I could see how that piece is gonna ultimately help me enjoy the destination a lot more. We want to be able to create this as a bridge. This is really where we start to talk about the plane but it's not necessarily about the plane. It's about those upgraded features of the plane that make us say yes. It's because we went ahead and upgraded to business class that we have a much more enjoyable in-flight experience, allowing us that when we arrive to our destination, we're feeling much more relaxed than ever before. This allows us to say yes, because we're very price conscious and we still wanna get there, we're gonna be enjoying the same level of service as our business class people at a price that is much more economical for your unique needs customer. Yes, that's exactly what I want. We're talking on specifically what each person wants. The same plane flies the business class, first class people as flies the economy. But we talk to each one as individuals, not try to sell an economy person all the features and benefits on why business class is amazing if they just are not interested in that. Okay. Awesome. You guys are all loving this. Um, yes, Julio. Is it, uh, who is the book of the author? So Susan Dabbs asks who's the book. So his name is um, Ilya Goldrat. Um, it's actually, it's the 30th anniversary um, edition. I'm, I'm actually, I'm only about 100 pages into it and I'm really enjoying it. So I do recommend it. Um, and is KO, um, KO suitable for solopreneur? Yes, absolutely. Because the graphic design is, um, is about what, what is the impression you want to leave every client beyond uh, with. Um, I love graphic designers uh, for our programs only because when Pepsi bought their logo for, I can't even remember what it was at the time, but it was like in millions of dollars. I think they spent like $15 million on revamping their logo, which essentially was only a slant of what their old logo had looked like. Um, why? Why did they get more money for that? Why, like any graphic designer on Fiverr could have done the exact same logo. The reason why one company got $50 million for it versus another person charging $50 for a logo is because they help to tell the story. They help the client to understand the impact on how a new logo is the impression that clients will perceive you at, ultimately allowing those clients to be better suited to say that is the company and the brand I want to be associated with. There's so much psychology behind it. And I, I honestly, I can talk to you forever about sales psychology. It's amazing. Um, but we're not gonna, we'll finish up today's webinar today. We'll finish up the webinar, the today's webinar today. I know you guys all want to be enjoying with me for like the next week. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, when do you want this? Okay, so number five, your timeline. Okay, so your timeline slide, I said this is your closing slide. Okay, let's be very clear. The timeline is not when do you want to start the project. 
That is the worst question you could ever ask the client. That is the equivalent of a personal trainer saying, so when do you want to lose that 10 pounds? The person's going to be like, I, it's not that I want to start losing that 10 pounds. Like when do you want to start working out? When do you want to start limiting your diet? You're like, oh, I don't want to start doing any of that. I just want it to already be gone, right? When do you want to start, see, start saving money in your bank account? No, I don't want to start. I just wish there was money already in my bank account. Nobody wants to start anything. If I didn't even have to sit here and make this decision as a buyer, I would already have the decision make. That's my ideal state. My ideal state is already to have chosen the person that I want to work with, not have to go through the process of starting this. So the worst question is, when do you want to start? The better question is, when do you want to see the result of this? When do you want to already know that it is working? That is a completely different question. One of them talks about where were you today? The other one talks about where are you going to be in the future? For us, um, one example I can use is we do sales training. And sometimes we work a lot with solopreneurs, um, individuals, small businesses. Occasionally we'll work with some teams of people. And in one, this one instance of a team of people, we didn't just talk about when do you want to start training your team, but when do you want to already see your team using these solutions? When do you want to see the first month of significant revenue growth? And the client and I started to talk about this. And what happens is magically, as you start to create the timeline for the client, and I'll draw it out right here. What you're, oops, we'll go one back here. Oh, now it's not even going to let me go back. What you're going to want to do is when you go ahead and you create the timeline for the client, we're actually going to start off by talking about when do they want this result. So this is when I want to see the impact of this. Um, the person that was in, so we had the graphic designer, right? This is when I already want to see all of my, my pieces being available. I want to start seeing my, my uh, customers downloading my free papers, my, my free um, you know, brochures and everything else like this. For the executive coach, this is when I want to actually, this is when we want to have our next executive board meeting and know that the changes in communication have already taken effect because we're able to have a much more effective board meeting. In my case with sales training, this was about when do we want to have it finished, right? When do we want to be wrapped up? We want to be wrapped up before Memorial Day. Okay, great. And then we start to move ourselves backwards. So if this is when you want to start to see the result, this is when the project needs to be signed. This is when, or sorry, this is when we need to start implementing. This is when we need to have it signed. And this is usually like today or two weeks of today. Okay. Now, if we focus on today or two weeks of today, the re what ends up happening is people end up losing this time space continuum. They forget that we're only three months away from this, right? What do you mean we're only three months away from September? <gasps> like, yes, absolutely. But when we start to think about September, September might seem like a far way away. But when we think about 12, what we need to do in that course of 12 weeks, we're like, oh, yeah, I need to start taking some type of action. I need to actually start doing something. This becomes the magic of sales. And this is why I said this is your closing slide because people will forget how far it is or they'll think that the distance is a lot further. But when we start to backtrack on all the things that need to happen before then, all of a sudden this creates that sense of urgency. This creates that I need to take action right now. And how we can help to stimulate that. So, you know, the sense of urgency really helps people to tell the stories that we tell, right? Well, we were working with a customer and they decided to wait on this decision, ultimately costing them more time and money. What we ended up doing is, yes, this might be the slow season for you. But what we found was when we started to unveil with the different changes that we were making, there was actually a lot more edits and one started to move to the other. By starting earlier, it allowed the client to ultimately have more time to work through all of the different edits that they wanted to see. So when they got to September, they could actually do a whole new brand relaunch. They could refresh with all these brand new materials, right? Time helps to move people to that sense of urgency. When do you want to see the results by and then help to move them backwards? <sighs> Slide number six, return on investment, investment and return on investment. It is never up to you to tell the client what the return on investment is. It is up to you to ask the questions 
and help the client tell you. A lot of people will come to me and say, Kim, how do I quantify my client's return on investment? And they will spend time researching white papers and industry averages and whatever it is. It is not up to you to figure it out. It is up to you to tell them because right from day one, right from the moment we meet our client, our client says, I am unique. I am different. I am completely individual, right? I am not the same as all those other clients because anything you tell me, it might have worked under that economic conditions, under that type of company size, under that particular geography, but I'm unique, I'm individual, I am different, and that might not work for me. Right from day one, our client has been saying that. And so there, we cannot go from I am unique and individual to, well, tell me what I should expect because everyone else has expected the same result. It is not the same. So instead of trying to tell your client what they should see as a return on investment, hoping that maybe something I tell you is going to be the right piece of information that is going to make it stick, Instead, what I want you to do is ask them the questions. Well, how would you know this was a valuable project for you, right? Well, can you tell me, the client will say to you, can you tell me what I can expect as a return on investment? And you'll be like, that is such a great question. How would you know that this was a valuable investment for your particular company, right? How would you know that the dollars you spent on this ended up paying you back? How would you know this was a valuable investment? How would you know we succeeded? How would you know? Find out from them what they say, and then when we get to that return on investment slide, we reiterate it back to them. Because when we show the price, the price is not the end of the conversation. It is a piece of information, and we don't just end it there but we give the piece of information and we, we allow it to come. When I worked for Xerox, they would tell us, give the entire piece, all the return on investment, tell the client the entire solution and cover the price with a piece of paper. And what we want you to do is when you get to the price point, I want you to unveil it. Unveil it like it was the most amazing magic trick. And the client will be so impressed with your unveiling of this price. They're going to be, whoa, and they're going to fall back in their seat with amazement. And they're going to be overwhelmed by saying just, yes, yes, we have to move forward on this. Now, I have yet to ever have a client experience price in that way. And I think even if your price was so low and you were exp explaining it to them with all this value, I think the only thing that we have is skepticism on, hmm, why is it so low? So instead of feeling like it's a magic trick, give the piece of information and remind them how they told you what they would expect to see because of that investment. Well, what you said was that you would have better client attrition, that you would end up having more employee engagement, that you would have way less of a churn rate in your, your customers, whatever it is. How would we know? How do we know? And we explain the investment. And when we eventually ask them, and how does that feel? We're not asking them, how does it feel, the price? But how does all of that goal, how does all of that wonderful things that you've told me were so important to you, how does that feel? Because price is never the objection. The only reason why people negotiate price is because they don't understand what the value was. And in, in next month, we're going to talk a little bit more about negotiations. Every month we do a no, new webinar. So stay with us. And we're going to talk about negotiations. We're going to continue to move ourselves around that sales cycle. But whenever somebody tells you that they can't afford it, let's be very clear. A budget will tell you what you can't afford but it will never stop you from buying it. We know this from personal experience. We know that we have all overspent at some point in our life on that car, on that vacation, on that service. I have overspent on amazing people in my company. I have spent way more in salaries on really good people because I believe that those are the people I want. I have spent a ton of money on marketing initiatives in my company because I know what my budget says, but that is actually gonna help me grow my business. So in that way, yes, I can't not afford it. I have to invest in that. So some final tips for proposals, use PowerPoint over Word. A Power, PowerPoint tells a story. It allows us to go slide by slide. We're gonna focus on the results, 
not on the journey. The reasons why you're going to invest in us is so that you can be here, customer, not because we're going to help you along on this path. And we're always going to have to land on the positives. And then finally, because the intention of the proposal is to make a decision, we ask the client, are you ready? Are you ready to create even more impact in your business? Are you ready to formalize this relationship? Are you ready that today is the day that you say yes to only premium clients? Whatever your question is, you ask it and you shut up. Allow them to say, yes, I am ready. Yes, today is the day. Yes, I'm re ready. And my final tip, because it's so important, stop, stop emailing proposals. This is so important to your business that it should not be driven to the lowest form of communication. Email is the lowest form of communication. And this is your last moment to show a prospect what it would be like to be your client. You do not go ahead and propose to your significant other by saying, hey baby, wanna get hitched? And then send. We don't propose to people like that. Therefore, we should not propose to our customers like that. If you care, show them that you care. Show them that you've put time and energy and that this deserves an in-person meeting, even if it's during Zoom. And you can look at their face and you share this information all the way through. This is me. Thank you so much for joining. I've saved some time, a few minutes at the end. Go ahead and put your questions in there. I am uh, LinkedIn's most influential sales leader to follow, Success Magazine's most inspirational blogger. And that is my third book, Sell More Faster. I'm going to put it in the chat. For those of you that have not seen um, or read my book, I, uh, I have a free, the full book for free as a download. Uh, you can just go to bit.ly slash sell more faster book. Um, and you can actually download the entire book for free. Um, or if you'd like to, if you prefer to actually hold on to it, contact a small bookstore. Let them know that you're interested in this book. They'll specially order it for you. You'll have it available for pickup or they will even ship it directly to you. I don't think Jeff Bezos needs any more of your money, but small business owners do. We are helping small business owners. I am also Startup Canada's most, uh, most um, in, sorry, I'm the woman entrepreneur of the year for Startup Canada. For those of you that are interested in just learning a little bit more about this, right? If you have a proposal coming up, you definitely need a sales strategy session. If you don't have any proposals coming up, you are just in the process of, I just need more clients, Kim. Where do I find clients right now? Then please contact us for a sales strategy session. That is um, our team's phone number. That is Dale on my team. You can text him 403 three nine zero nine seven nine three put your name say dale i want one of your five available spots for uh for a sales strategy session i asked him to clear out some time in his calendar tomorrow he says that he only he wasn't able to clear out every single meeting he was only able to clear out five meetings let him know that you want one of those spots but other people seen amazing results jenny said that she went from a close ratio of 20 to 30 percent one in three, less than one, one in five, one in five deals were saying yes to her before this. And now she ends up seeing that seven in 10 say yes. Almost every single proposal that she delivers says yes. And if they don't, the next one definitely does. Rob Crooks said, listen, the longer that you wait, this is revenue that you're missing out. His only regret was that he didn't start learning sales process sooner. He says, I, I, hit myself on the head thinking about how many deals I could have had. He's like, and ultimately I didn't allow them to go through. And Steven Vaidera said that he ended up doubling their qualified leads and quadrupling their business. He ended up increasing two times the number of conversations that they were had, but four times the amount of revenue. When I say you can sell more faster, make more money, have way better clients, this is what I'm talking about. Imagine having every client be worth at least double what you were paying them. Here's that number one more time. If you haven't already texted Dale, 
9793. I'm going to give this three, two, one. All right. Hopefully you've copied it down because at the end of the day, this is our number one value for KO is Zig Ziglar. If LinkedIn calls me their most influential sales leader to follow, this is my most influential sales leader to follow. And he says, you can have everything you want in life if you help enough people get what they want. I want to help you get everything that you want and deserve in your life. And that's the whole reason why we're here. Awesome. Let's see. We have a few questions in here. Um, what suggestion to submit a proposal during COVID-19 if we should not use electronic? No, Curtis, I want to be very clear. I think that you should deliver your proposals via Zoom or via FaceTime or Skype or however you want to, but it needs to be a face-to-face -face meeting. If it's not in a meeting when you're booking, when you're delivering the proposal, it does not exist. If the client can't meet with you for the most important moment to become a prospect to a client, then I want you to hold off or I want you to ask yourself if they can't meet with me right now to understand how, what they're investing in, when will they meet with me to know that they're actually getting the right investment? This needs to be a meeting in the calendar. Okay. And then you can go ahead and deliver it that way. Great question. Um, Gregory, uh, I think this is a follow-up to your question. I was going to buy a small business, not related. Um, uh, the six side concept applies really. Do you have ideas I could adapt? Um, maybe some do's and don'ts. Um, I need to this yes in the end of the offer. Um, so if you're, if you're talking about doing a proposal to buy the business, um, really, I mean, in this case, if, you're, if we're talking about that, like, you know, I want to buy this business, um, I'm going to deliver a proposal to the people that I'm potentially buying from. How, everybody's goals are individual. For a person that's wanting to have their business bought, chances are they want more freedom, they want more time, they want seed money to start something else, whatever it is. Absolutely, why not discuss it with them, right? Where do you want to be? How will this impact yours? Um, Tracy, oh, good, our lead. I'm so glad. Yes, uh, please use the information. Also, please book a, um, a session with us because we'll be able to give you even more tips um, and make sure that it's really going to help you get that close. Um, any tips on leadership coaching that obviously works best with in-person groups? And I have, yeah. So we're very fortunate. All of our classrooms have always been online. Um, we were actually one of the first sales training companies to actually deliver everything online. And so going from an in-person to an online, um, an online process does not work very easily. Um, and thank you to those of you that have, are able to, to stick around for some additional questions. I, it was a pleasure talking to all of you. Um, I'll, I'll stay on for about three more minutes here and answer as many questions. Um, if, you're if you're moving to all virtual workshops, the idea with virtual is that you have to limit your time. Um, so do them in no, um, no less than, uh, sorry, it's two hours, 90 minutes is actually kind of the max to have somebody sit for an entire session. Uh, we've started doing a couple two hour sessions, but we are very apparent to put a five minute break in between those two hours. You don't have to do these in person, but online, because we're all suffering from Zoom fatigue, we need that five minute break. Make it as interactive as possible. Move people to breakout rooms, have them on discussion points. You're going to move yourself a little bit more towards a facilitator as post to an instructor. Allow people to come to their own conclusions. Dan Gallagher, uh, how do you implement checks along the sales process to avoid sticker shock? Yes. So, um, so Dan, great question. We call this anchoring. We cover it in our, um, in near the end of our, our modules, but anchoring essentially sets um, a uh, price expectation up here that's down here. So for instance, I'll tell people, um, if I'm in a sales cycle, I'll say things like, you know, typically people will invest as much as $50,000 for, for a sales training. And knowing that we're going to be able to get you for a fraction of that price is going to help to make this a lot more reasonable for you. So what I, what I essentially did, um, and actually I would use two different price points. So for us, what I would say is, you know, tra training is um, very similar to us in person. Like, so if you wanted to hire me for an entire day of training, that's $10,000 thousand dollars right there. And if I'm training you every single week over the course of 12 weeks, an investment of 50 to 50 is only a fraction of that. And think about how much greater of an impact that you created. So what I do when I anchor is I set a high price expectation first. How much could it be or even more than what it could be? Maybe a comparison, um, a, an individual price. If you were to buy this all individually, this is how much it could be. And we're going to get you down to here. 
people are going to get sticker shock regardless, Dan, regardless whether I show you a really low price or a really high price. So if I'm going to give you sticker shock, no matter what the price is, let's get them to sticker shock up here. And then we bring them down and then we bring them down. Dan Pink in his book, When, also described this, where he says, give people bad news first and then the good news, because what it will help them to do is make them more excited. Nobody ever sees the lowest price and be like, this was amazing. How much more can you sell it for to me for? How much more can I pay for this, right? Nobody ever says that. What they ultimately say is, um, what they ultimately say is, well, what can you do for less? What can you do for less? And so, by giving them a really high number and moving them down, it helps them. We talk a lot more about anchoring as well through the program because it can affect time, expectations, and various things. And ultimately, what it's going to do is, by having that type of conversation earlier on, you actually exceed your client's expectations and allow them to be even happier with you. Uh, Suzanne, yeah, thank you very much. Always great listening. And then finally, Maria you're the last question any tips or ideas how to apply this to closed bid tenders yes so with closed bid tenders um what you're what you want to do i mean as much as possible you all you ultimately want to be in front of the conversation before the bid comes out um, i am a big believer in not bidding on somebody unless you already have a relationship with them otherwise you are just showing them but showing them a price and then hoping that price is, is going to stick with my clients, with our students, I say you never want to be compared on a spreadsheet because you will always lose on a spreadsheet. My students are not the lowest price. We all want to be the premium price. Therefore we are okay losing on a spreadsheet, which means that we have to sell a lot better on the value that we ultimately have. So the other things that you can do is if you can understand what the client's goals are, you want to talk about the goals. You want to ultimately allowing you to do this, ultimately allowing you to do this. You're also going to get a lot clearer on stories, Maria. We cover stories. Stories are so important in the sales cycle that we actually spend a whole module, um, a whole 90 minutes talking specifically on stories. And how do you create a story in three sentences or less that helps to get somebody emotionally charged? We talk Talk about a lot about emotional intelligence and emotional charge in the B2B sales cycle because it's that important. Thank you. I put Dale's number on there one more time. He, um, he just sent me a text message saying that he opened up a couple more spots. So there are two more spots available. Be one of those last two spots, 403-390-9793. I hope to see you all next month. It was an absolute pleasure. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Goodbye.